welcome to Bright Christian Church. I'm so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. If this is your first time, we just want to welcome you and encourage you to grab one of the white welcome bags that um, is right outside the doors that has connection card and communion that we'll need later in the service. Today is an exciting service as we have two transitions going on. Jeff today will be giving his last message as lead minister and will be transitioning into the teaching minister role. And today, Greg will step into the lead minister role. Uh, both just exciting things that we're ready to celebrate and love on both of these gentlemen. If you would stand, we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. And Father, um, we just lift, are about to lift up our voices and praise you. And, and Father, um, I just ask that you clear our minds so that we can focus on you and all that you are. We love you, and it's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Oh, 
He is all that we will ever be. And it's just nice to rest in His presence.
it's easy in today's world to get caught up in the distractions that hinder us from our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes we just need to take a step back. We need to really appreciate what he's done for us. Because he came down from heaven to earth, fully God, fully human, lived a perfect life, and then died on the cross so that we can experience just hope and peace. That we can live as humans, really imperfect, extremely imperfect, and still have a path and a chance for eternal life, eternal peace and hope. So just keep that in mind today as we uh, take communion. You can peel back that first tab. Eat the bread in remembrance of the body that Jesus broke for us. And then in the same way, peel back that second tab, drink the juice, again remembering the blood that Jesus poured out for us. Dear God, I thank you. Thank you that we can come here this morning and praise your name freely. But I thank you for your son, for the sacrifice that he made so that we can live for you. Lord, I thank you that, that your son, Jesus, was the only person that could make that ultimate sacrifice. Lord, because of his perfect life, because of that perfect sacrifice, there's no one else, there's nothing else that could replace him. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. The philosopher William James wisely observed, the greatest use of life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. You only get one life to live. And we must maximize this gift. That's why I love the poem, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. As I complete a, a four decade run today, I want to challenge you to understand the importance of committing your life to become a Christ follower and embracing the reward of trying to live each day on assignment from God, doing his work wherever you are. 41 and a half years ago, I began to serve as a ministry intern at the First Christian Church in Springfield, Ohio. At a time when mega churches were rare, First Christian ran over a thousand in worship and had an almost unheard of 800 people involved weekly in Sunday school. The church led by John Wilson was well respected for a commitment to mission giving and for producing many ministers and, and missionaries. My time as, as an intern provided a practical taste of ministry, and it was an invaluable experience. I had just completed my sophomore year of Bible college, and ever since that day, 41 and a half years ago until now, I've been involved in a vocational ministry position serving in the local church. Today, the, the average minister serves in ministry for seven years, and then leaves the ministry to find other employment in sales and education or in business. The pressures and expectations on the leader and his family are real and intense. And consequently, there's a growing shortage of, of ministers in America. By the grace of God and because of serving generally positive churches, I've found fulfillment in ministry where many have found only frustration. And as I look back, I've learned some lessons that I wanna to share today. Lesson number one is God will equip you for the tasks he assigns you. I was five years old when I first decided that I wanted to be a minister. My dad was my minister and I would stand with him at the back door of the Western Hills Church of Christ after the worship service and shake hands with people as they exited the worship area. Now this was long before the coronavirus and we weren't fist bumping or, or elbow bumping yet at, at that time. At eight years old, I, I committed my life to Christ and 
I was baptized by my dad. I started riding my bike to visit some elderly members of our church who lived nearby and, and needed some encouragement. Uh, Emmett and Julia Birch, uh, Dottie Davis. And we have a lot of ministers in my family. My, my father, my grandfather, three of my uncles, my brother, my brother-in-law are, are all ministers. Ministry is in my DNA. I, I was never pushed to enter the ministry. I just always felt called by God to, to enter the ministry. In, in sixth grade, my class at Delshire Elementary School wrote papers on what I want to do when I grow up. And I wrote about being a minister and, and helping others that way. That continued on into high school at Oak Hills where in speech class, Steve Owens and I preached sermons each time for our speeches. And when I would take that standard achievement test to determine potential career paths, uh, the first area of interest, I would take my number two pencil and darken the circle for clergy. And my second choice would be to darken the circle for agriculture. Now, at first glance, those two careers may seem light years apart, but actually they're much closer than they might at first appear. A farmer cultivates the soil, sows the seed, removes the weeds, harvests the crop. A minister does the same as a farmer, only with the gospel. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 9, Jesus gave the parable of the sower, and he likened the people to being like soil, awaiting the gospel seed that takes root and, and grows. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And the life experiences that we all have serve to equip us all for the tasks that God will assign us. But the blessings and challenges we encounter in life, they shape and prepare each of us. Our family was in a, a serious car accident when I was a child, and that helped make me a more compassionate person to the hurts of others. I, I used to go calling with my dad on people in the church, and that made me a more social and, and confident person. I've cheered for the Reds and, and Bengals throughout my life, and that served to teach me to be gracious in defeat. But another contributing factor in my decision to enter the ministry was the fact that I had a hard time sitting still and being quiet in church. I discovered that as a minister, I could stand up, I could walk around, and I could talk in church. It checked all the boxes. Well, you are unique. God will use your personal gifts, your personality, your life experiences to prep you for serving him. God will equip you for the tasks he assigns you. Mother Teresa was once quizzed by a skeptic. How do you expect to change the world? Her answer was classic. One person at a time. So lesson number one, God will equip you for the tasks he assigns you. Lesson number two, God can change anyone who will let him. God uses human instruments despite our weaknesses. A.W. Tozer said, God can use any cup, even a broken one, as long as it is clean. I've always seen myself as one flawed fellow struggler trying to point the way to other co-strugglers. No one is more acutely aware of my weaknesses than I am. Never have I tried to project an attitude of having it all together, but instead I've tried to always acknowledge authentically that the reality of my own struggle to live as, as Christ lived. I balance my imperfections with the fact that if we wait until we are morally perfect to serve the Lord, we will never serve Him. The Apostle Paul understood that tension, and he invited others in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, 
follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I like that perspective. Philippians chapter 3, he went on to offer these words of self-inventory. Having been a Christian for more than 20 years at that time, Paul assessed his spiritual maturity in this way. He said, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He goes on, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. If you feel like you haven't arrived yet in your faith, you are not alone. Remember, God can change anyone who will let him as long as we don't check out. So don't give up. And I recall while serving as associate minister in Georgetown, Ohio, we had a boy in our high school youth group who was a nice kid when he was on his medicine. And we had a caravan of cars driving north on 71, going to take a group to the Ohio Teens for Christ up in Canton. A sponsor was driving the church van and I was seated in the second bench when I heard shouts, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. I looked up to see that boy that I had mentioned from our youth group who was in front of me choking the living daylights out of a smaller boy seated in front of him. So with a split second to respond, it's life or death, what do you do? I reached up and started choking the choker until I, I broke his chokehold on the stunned smaller student. Johnny was driving our car behind the van and she pulled alongside to see why the van had slowed down and she saw this trio of a stranglehold procession framed by the church van letter, Georgetown Church of Christ, you know, Christians who love you. This volatile young man kept growing in his walk with the Lord and a few years later he was working two jobs in order to save money to participate in multiple mission trips to Haiti each year. God can change anyone who will let him. Amen. Lesson number three, friendships in church will span from earth into heaven. My wife, Johnny, has been a great friend and partner in ministry throughout the past 41 and a half years. So much of what has been able to be accomplished can be directly traced to her contribution and partnership. During my junior and senior years of college, I preached at a little country church outside of Brooksville, Kentucky in Bracken County. During my two years at Wellsburg, the church experienced phenomenal growth with a 50% increase in worship attendance. That's right, we went all the way from 20 people to 30 people in attendance. After going to school full-time and working two part-time jobs throughout the week, on Sundays I would drive an hour and a half down to Wellsburg, teach an adult Bible Sunday school class, uh, preach for the Sunday morning message, go calling in the afternoon, and then preach another message for Sunday evening, receiving $50 a week. Although it wasn't lucrative, it provided a great learning experience that was priceless. And some of the friends that I brought along with us to Wellsburg included Dave Vaughn and Tom Stern, and they received an up-close glimpse of rural ministry. When I started my, my ministry there, Johnny and I were engaged to be married, and some of the older ladies were interrogating her. Do you play the piano? One wanted to know. Johnny said, I can play chopsticks. Another woman probed, can you sing solos for special music? Johnny explained, well, I'm comfortable singing in a group, but, but not singing a solo. One especially crusty matron snipped, you can't play the piano, you can't sing solos, what good are you as a minister's wife? 
I, I jumped to Johnny's defense and responded quickly, she's a good encourager, and she has been. Her, her chosen area of ministry has been working with preschool children as a, a teacher during the week and volunteering with that age again on, on Sundays and, and faith filled. And I want to acknowledge the, the elders and the staffs with whom I've, I've served both here and in my previous ministries. These godly individuals have been a, a blessing to me and it has been an honor to serve alongside them in this kingdom venture. I want to acknowledge my dad and mom for their immense influence on my life and ministry. My dad's example and integrity coupled with my mom's encouragement and support have proven invaluable. Bob Russell who has been my minister via his weekly recorded messages from 1982 until 2006, after which time my brother Dave has, has been my minister from 2006 to the present. Roy Weiss profoundly modeled for me how to make every conversation count and every day with every person encountered to point them toward Christ in eternity. Harvey Breen provided guidance, example, and friendship. Ministry mentors like Dick Alexander and Dave Rubcup have spoken into my life since I was a teen and have remained positive role models to me and still today. Some of the moments in ministry that stand out to me include partnering with two Christian schools, being instrumental in effecting an adoption, and then being honored to sign the adoption papers as a witness, being on the scene to minister when Jack Carpenter was hit and killed, helping with the search when Colin Schroeder was missing, seeing 14-year-old Nate Jacobus's divine recovery from a, a gunshot wound to the head, and then years later, being asked to perform his wedding, to, to his marriage to Maggie. And interceding in prayer for Dave Root in the ICU and, and witnessing his miraculous recovery. Some of you may remember the Sunday when we, we did take off your shoes for Haiti. And everyone came in wearing shoes, and most people left without shoes as we, we filled this platform with, with shoes as well as two trailers outside as we gave them new and, and new shoes. I remember participating in four meal packing for Haiti events. And I remember helping raise $85,000 in five weeks to plant a church in Ecuador, which has now produced two daughter churches. I remember us helping raise $45,000 to underwrite the master's degree graduate studies for Clinton and Fonuel, ministers in Nairobi, Kenya, who became the first students in a, a TCM program that is now reaching 30 ministers annually in, in Kenya. I, I've seen a heightened mission awareness and involvement here at, at DCC. One year we had 85 members who went on multiple mission trips that year alone. I've enjoyed making multiple mission trips to Ecuador, to Kenya, to St. Vincent Island, as well as Jamaica and, and Mexico. Making four trips to Israel and getting to baptize people in the Jordan River. Watching BCC's indebtedness reduce from $5 million to $2 million. Building our sports and a fitness center for community outreach entirely debt free. I'm grateful that zero dollars in new debt have occurred under my ministry. I think bringing an external focus to BCC is probably my greatest contribution to the DNA of our church. Probably the most popular contribution was my bringing the gift of chocolate candy on Mother's Day and Father's Day as our, our gift to parents. <laughs> Seeing our, our church lead the way with impact projects in, in Bright, serving local businesses, schools, the police, firemen, the Bright Festival, libraries, hospitals, retirement villages, and drug awareness programs in Jesus' name. I've enjoyed helping prison inmates get their lives redirected 
Dearborn County and Georgetown and Branchville and Henryville and Marion and Orient. I think of the interns trained who are now serving in ministry throughout the United States. Over 550 couples that I've married. Innumerable marriages that have been strengthened and saved through family counseling. Think of the dozens of weeks I served in church camp or CIY or VBS. I calculate and preached about 3,500 messages. Think of the comfort given in hundreds of funerals, the salvation received in, in baptism by thousands, the, the countless restaurant workers and bank tellers and hobby friends and disabled motorists that I've been able to point toward the Lord. The, the numerous single parents who found encouragement. I remember an early morning hospital call on Lola two weeks after I began my ministry at Dublin. She was a, an elderly lady who had a tracheotomy opening in her throat, which was covered by a, a thin square gauze pad. And that morning, as I went in to pray with her before her surgery, she was nervous, so I wanted to put her at ease so I, I used some humor, I, I cracked a joke to, to relax her anxiety. And she really liked my quip. And she began to laugh enthusiastically, uh, uproariously. And then it happened. She ingested her gauze pad into the tracheotomy opening and suddenly it was blocking her windpipe and her breathing. I rushed down the hall, got a nurse who immediately came in and reached into that small opening in Lola's throat with a metal instrument that resembled a pair of needle nose pliers, skillfully fastening on the corner of the gauze pad and retrieving it, saving Lola's life. My 18 years of ministry at Dublin could have been ended abruptly in my second week had I inadvertently killed one of our members. I expect I will see Lola in heaven one day and we'll relive that story. And I'm sure she'll laugh, but this time without any danger. Lesson number three, friendships in the church will span from earth into heaven. The final lesson, lesson number four, people are the greatest investment of all. It's not about programs or buildings. I've helped acquire properties for expansion and, and led five different building programs. It's really about people changing lives for eternity. We want to make it hard to go to hell and bring. People are an eternal investment. With our lives, we each have a limited opportunity to sow gospel seeds and, and to reap the harvest. If we invest in helping people prepare for heaven, we will experience the unsurpassed joy that comes from truly making an eternal difference. As a young minister, I, I sought advice and cultivated relationships with some great, godly, uh, spiritual giants, veterans in ministry. I, I gained a lot from the, getting to know these older mentors like George Mark Elliott, Alva Sizemore, Glenn Wheeler, Wayne Smith, and Edwin Hayden. Uh, Edwin Hayden served as the editor of the Christian Standard Magazine prior to our dad's 25-year stint. I remember as a, as a Bible college student taking Mr. Hayden out to eat for a fancy lunch at Roy Rogers next to Western Hills High School. This was the equivalent of a visit to Arby's today. And he gave me some wise investment advice that day, which I've never forgotten. As we ate our roast beef sandwiches, he told me, Jeff, invest your life in people. People are the greatest investment. And I couldn't agree more. And, and I'm grateful for the guidance that he gave me that day when I was still a teen. Colossians 1.28 rifles in on every Christian's duty. It says, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. When I began at Dublin, one of the deacons asked a question that 
hinted at his expectation in me as the new minister. Cynically, he inquired, well, what's your bag of tricks to build the church? I knew what he meant. And in other words, what's your tactic? What's your approach? What's your program? What conference have you recently attended that is touting the latest silver bullet to build the church? My answer seemed to surprise him. I took a page from the Vince Lombardi playbook and told him just fundamentals. Love people, teach the Bible, meet needs. And that may sound simplistic, basic, but growing a church is rooted in the basic understanding that most people are looking for a place to fit in and be a part of God's family. And that hasn't changed in over 2,000 years. But with that in mind, my, my lifelong approach to ministry has not been so much program-based as it has been people-based. And now entering into a new role of full-time ministry provides a chance for reflection about life and how I want to continue to impact the world right up until my final day of life. I hope today's a day of reflection for you. Have you thought, what do I want on my tombstone? How would you encapsulate your life? James Dobson's father said, if he could select his epitaph, he would inscribe, he prayed. I think I would choose for my inscription, he loved God, he loved his family, he loved people. I'm pretty sure Johnny would, would add, he loved horses, he loved skyline. <laughs> so tomorrow I will begin a two month sabbatical, a time to renew spiritually, to recharge for the next season of ministry when I will return on January 1st as full time teaching minister here. This role will provide the opportunity to, to teach, to preach, to share Christ with others, to provide care to those in need, to generate more events for seniors, to provide counseling, to encourage those who are struggling. After living a, a tightly scheduled life for so long, it, it will be a welcome change to have a more relaxed sabbatical that will still offer conversations and contacts whom I want to compel to go farther in their journeys to get to know Jesus better. I hope that I have another 15 years of kingdom work in me to, to bring in the harvest. I, I want to finish strong and not become a statistic. I want to go to heaven when I die and take as many people with me as possible. When I get to that wonderful city and the saints all around me appear, I want to have somebody tell me it was you who invited me here. So thanks for, for letting me reminisce today and share some lessons learned along the way. Days like today serve as an important purpose for us in providing us with an opportunity to take inventory of our own lives in the past and, and then to do better as we go forward in the future. So how is it with you today? Do you have that certainty that your life is right with the Lord? Are you investing your life and your influence and in pointing others to Jesus Christ? Do your good friends know your best friend, Jesus? But what if more people caught the vision of living each day on assignment from God, seeing the people encountered throughout the day as being divine appointments provided by the Lord. Please realize that every day you have the opportunity to redirect a destiny, to, to raise the trajectory of someone's life. I said at the beginning, you only get one life to live, but there's one exception to that. If you're born once, you will die twice. But if you were born twice, you will only die once. You can choose to improve the quality of your life in the here and now and increase the quantity of your life in the hereafter. If you need to respond to the Lord today, 
but we have a team ready to listen, guide, and assist you in your journey with Jesus. But we invite you to surrender to him today. You can come to the front as we worship. Never forget, only one life will soon be passed. Only one's done for Christ will last. Would you stand? Thank you, God. through uh, the Trunk or Treat out Outreach. It's the first time that I met him. and He's been active in our pickleball on Monday and Thursday nights and has been a part of that. And so, anyway, I had the privilege of baptizing Jason here this, this past Monday and just wanted to, to celebrate that good news and to make you aware of that. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for that great message. Jeff. My, my name is Dave uh, Stone. I'm Jeff's brother. And uh, I have the task of trying to capsulize the, the good fruit that has come from Jeff's 41 years of ministry in about five minutes time. And I will do my best to do that. And I appreciate uh, Bright Church asking me to participate in this. Uh, Jeff preached back in high school. I always looked up to him and, and enjoyed every time he preached, whether it was at church, whether it was in a high school uh, public speaking class. Uh, he did went on, as he mentioned, to cut his teeth in his first ministry that was full-time uh, that 
He poured into this little church in Kentucky in powerful fashion, and I think that's really when he fell in love with preaching. He served as an associate minister for a number of years, which revealed the team player uh, that he is. He then became the minister of a church who was trying to overcome the pain of the moral failure of their previous pastor. And the growth and the, the health during that season of ministry it still left an indelible, a positive mark on the central Ohio region. And, and then he answered the call to come and to serve here at Bright uh, at a pivotal time in, in her life. And uh, he's done an exceptional job in his study, leadership, uh, the sports and, and fitness center is a powerful testimony uh, to just the way he views ministry, as he talked about just loving people. And I, I agree in and concur that I think the greatest thing that uh, has happened in his 11 and a half years here has just been his, his passion that he has for people and the way that God has used him to uh, externally focus the church. You know, churches are notorious for looking inward, and I think he's done a great job of, of causing uh, churches to look outward. One common characteristic of all 40 plus years of, of ministry for Jeff is that for him, ministry has always stretched beyond the duties that are listed on the job description. And he never saw it as a 40 or 50 hour a week job. He just always saw it as a way to minister to people. And he prioritized his family, he prioritized his job. And after his kids were grown, oftentimes he made himself available even on, on his days off if someone was in need. Uh, when people ask me about my brother, I describe Jeff as a, as a pastor to people and a pastor to pastors. And he's an Excellent preacher, as you know, who communicates God's word truthfully and faithfully and humbly and creatively and boldly. But it goes beyond that. When you have someone whose public life matches his private life, that is what draws us to Christ in him. Whether he was serving on uh, the Board of Stewards for the North American Christian Dimension or was a board member for the uh, Christian Village at Mount Healthy or Worthington Christian Village or the chaplain for East Central High School or football team or the president for a state convention or the president of the Central Ohio Ministers Fellowship or the president of the North American Christian Convention. You know, all these different titles that he has worn and, and yet he just, he just wants to be a friend to people. He just wants to love people. And titles and notoriety don't carry much weight to Jeff who, who serves an audience of one. Career is what you are paid for. A calling is what you are made for. And Jeff Stone was made for ministry. Ministry can be difficult and draining and the hours can take a toll on your health, your, your marriage, and, and on your family. And yet pastors are expected to to lead like King David and have the purity of Joseph and have the wisdom of Solomon, have the perseverance of Paul, have the passion of Peter and have the forgiveness of Christ. And Jeff has done a pretty good job in all those categories still. Amen. And for every story that you have ever heard from others about Jeff's genuine concern for, for people, there are 10 times as many that no one has ever heard, but there's a God who sees everything. And someday what was done in secret will be rewarded. The other day I was talking to my, my daughter-in-law, and she's only been in the family a little over a year, and she was asking me about Jeff, and so I was trying to describe Jeff, and I told her some stories about all the way he serves people. How he'd take a vacation day and drive to see a discouraged preacher. He'd meet with a couple that he baptized 20 years before just because they were having marital problems. He'd visit strangers in prison who he had never met before and, uh, and then continues to visit them monthly. Uh, a few years ago, I was watching a movie. I was sitting in Louisville, I'm in my home. I'm watching TV and watching a movie on Comedy Central. And out of the blue, a Skyline commercial comes on. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and I see Jeff in the Skyline commercial. 
and he's talking about all the cheese that they give you. And I pick up the phone and call him. I said, dude, I'm, I'm watching a movie and all of a sudden you pop up in the middle of it in a commercial. Yeah. I said, how did you end up in a Skyline commercial? He said, well, you know, anytime they open a Skyline, they usually call me up because I will say, I can have 40 people there for your very first meal if you'll open it up an hour before the actual place opens up. And he said, I'll have 40 people for you there. He would just get ministers from around the area. And so now whenever they open the Skyline, they, they call Jeff up. And then in addition to that, they, they put him in, in their commercials because he, he looks like a model, you know? <laughs> But that's how Jeff is. He, he's always just making relationships and building friendships with people. Throughout his ministry, he has treated the down and out person the same way he treats the wealthy, influential person. My wife said that Jeff is a genuine servant who doesn't call attention to himself. Dozens of young men and, and young women entered the ministry because of his encouragement and vision. He always takes time for others. Jesus was never in a hurry. Jeff is never in a hurry. John has been beside him every step of the way. He's a faithful confidant. <laughs> With a servant's heart. No one knows what a preacher's wife goes through and all that, uh, that they entail. Uh, when they take on that role of being a preacher's wife. Jeff will never know how much I watched him throughout his ministry, especially in my early years, and, and how his love for people shaped the way that so many pastors uh, minister in their churches, including me. He loves his flock well. He went to Israel with me with a church group from Southeast, and uh, he still ministers to all of those people that were on that trip. He, he did a funeral for someone who was on that trip. They didn't ask me to do the funeral. <laughs> they called up my brother who lives two hours away because of the way he continued to reach out to them after that trip was over. My brother has been my greatest encourager. He epitomizes the scripture, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And Greg, I want to say to you, Jeff is thrilled that you are the one taking the lead pastor role. And he will encourage you. He is thrilled that you are that person. And he will encourage you. And he will rejoice with you. And he will be there if you need to mourn as well. He will support you and Amy. He will have your back. He will be as loyal as the day is long. Wow, I had a hard time saying that. That was a long sentence. Uh, I preached a sermon last weekend in Arizona on the topic, the legacy of a leader. And the main points of my talk were the four characteristics that I see in my brother. Intentionality, humility, integrity, and consistency. And the greatest observation that I can make of Jeff from watching him for 59 years but for 41 years in ministry, is this. I see Jesus in you. I've seen him all your life. I see Jesus in your ministry. I'm very excited to see how God will continue to use you in the months and years to come. I'm going to invite you to watch the screen. There's going to be a couple of videos that we're going to get to watch together. My name is Randy Beard and I'm just brother-in-law. My home church went through an ugly split during my senior year of Bible college and I had serious reservations about whether I really wanted to be involved in vocational ministry. But Jeff was one of those calm, assuring uh, voices of encouragement that led me through months of contemplation and I decided to follow God's leading into ministry. And so I just wanna thank God every day uh, for all the people uh, that I've been able to touch through the years and I thank Jeff Stone. I love you, brother. I've known Jeff since my family moved to the church when I was in first grade. And ever since I was a little kid, Jeff has always been extremely kind to me and has always made me feel extremely appreciated. He has always reached out to me, texted me, let me know I was in his prayers. 
rather it be something small like I have a big test the next day at school or something more major like me being on quarantine. He has just always made me feel very loved and appreciated. Hey Jeff, greetings to you and Johnny both from the great state of Tennessee. Rosemary and I are so excited for you and celebrate with you 41 and a half years of ministry. That is a great thing, a tremendous accomplishment, and something to be very proud of. It's only because of your character, integrity, and love for people. Hey, Jeff, I just wanted to wish you well in your new role. I just thank you so much for taking a chance on me 18 years ago and helping me get into the ministry, into a vacation that I still love every day. I thank you for your great example as a husband and a dad and just a great friend. And one thing that really sticks out is how you've always had a heart for hurting people, uh, had the eyes and ears to see people on the fringes and to make sure that they knew God's grace. What an incredible gift. Love you and wish you the best. Judy and I moved to Dearborn County in fall 2016 to live closer to our extended family and began searching for a Christian church. We visited over a dozen congregations before deciding to become BCC members the first Sunday in 2017. We have refreshed our friendship with Johnny Stone that we had known much earlier in her life and became familiar and impressed with Jeff's ministry. We certainly respect his leadership of our congregation and are very appreciative of his leadership of the Wednesday evening life group. It is a vital part of our life in the Lord's body. Thank you, Jeff and Johnny. Hi, Jeff and Johnny. It has been an honor to work alongside you the past 11 years and to get to witness firsthand the authentic love and compassion you have for people and your great desire to see them have a saving relationship with Christ. Anyone who knows you knows you have a great gift for remembering people's names, making them feel special, and caring for them deeply. So I just want to thank you for the witness you've been to me as I have watched you love God passionately, follow his word completely, and love people genuinely. Congratulations on 41 and a half years of ministry. Jeff, I just want to tell you that thank you so much for what you've done to us. When I say us, it's Christopher and I. I appreciate it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because of you, we came a Christians. Uh, you never keep up with us. You always invited, invited, invited to us. And then we're here. We love it. And it's always because of you. Thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. And then God bless you. Jeff, just want to say congratulations and thanks for being a great leader and a great teacher, especially with your lifestyle. Both you and Johnny really live out 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4, um, with your example of shepherding with a heart and by your example. So uh, continued thanks for your friendship and the fact that we're brothers. Um, I just join with many others in saying that we're praying for you and we're excited about this next chapter that God has for you. And one more thing. I love you, guy. Peace. Having Westsider for a minister was my initial connection to BCC. Having you as a person that put me on the right path to God is my biggest blessing. Please never change, except maybe during your sabbatical, you could take a drawing course. Love you, buddy. Hey, Jeff and Johnny, I just wanna say congratulations on your 41 and a half years of ministry and definitely thank you for everything that you've done specifically for us and for our whole church family. I think it's pretty amazing how you um, reach into people's lives, even with a church of this size. And I know we've certainly appreciated your support over the years and your friendship. Um, you know, you've been there for us in the tough times when Paul's been in the hospital, you've always visited, except this summer when you weren't allowed to and you offered to, um, I think in your words, run a covert operation to bring him some food that he wanted. Um, so we've always appreciated that, your visits, your phone calls, your texts, and you've also been there for the good times, um, you know, things like celebrating Groundhog Day, bear sightings in the Smokies, and, um, you know, we just appreciate your, your time to do all the things that you do, and I want to make sure that you know it definitely matters. So thank you, we love you, and congratulations. Spike, you rock! <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I mean, Jeff. 
Uh, just wanted to thank you for all your years of service. I've been reflecting on our hi, time um, many years ago when I interned for you. She said, hi, uh, Jeff. Just learned so much from you. Just have always admired your heart for the Lord and just um, your servant's heart and your willingness to just help anyone in need. So we love you and thank you so much for all you've done in the ministry and in our lives. What do you want to say, Wynn? Thank you, Spike. Aww. 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 Bye, Jeff. <laughs> I want to share some thoughts on behalf of the elders about our time serving with Jeff. Know that all seven of your elders consider Jeff to be a friend, a good friend. He has a lot of attributes, but two of the standouts that Jeff brings to our friendship is his ability to bring calm and prayer into every situation. You know, we often quote Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good, for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But we don't always live that we believe these words. Jeff does believe it. He likes to say when we work, we work, and when we pray, God works. Sometimes to our dismay, thinking we need to work harder, Jeff calmly shows us that God makes everything work when we love him and pray to him. Whether through crisis or celebration, Jeff leads spiritually. He listens and always redirects fear toward praying to God, our Father, the only one that can really heal our situation. I was reading how historically people received their last name to further identify themselves as towns grew in populations and folks traveled more. Many last names were given based on occupation. When I was thinking about Jeff, Jeff today, I immediately thought Jeff the evangelizer. This is because Jeff Stone is an evangelizer, just like John the Baptist was a baptizer. Jeff promotes the Christian gospel enthusiastically. I remember my first meeting with Jeff at the Olive Garden back in 2012. I took notice that Jeff was genuinely glad to get to know our server. This authentic desire to love people was evident anytime and everywhere Jeff went. He knows the people whose paths he's crossed wherever he goes. I mean, he really knows them. He can ask, how is your mom Dorothy doing since her surgery? Or how is Andy doing in school to people that many of us wouldn't take the time to get to know? It doesn't matter the place or the business or the occasion or the time of day. Jeff, the evangelizer, is loving people and inviting them to church and church events. Whether they accept his invitation or not, you can tell he authentically loves them and they are encouraged by his kindness toward them. I saw this most prominently from Jeff at a very small funeral in Greendale a while back. The funeral was sparsely attended because the young man who died had likely burned a lot of bridges. He spent time in a high security prison for crimes surrounding drugs. In the small room with a few friends and family members, I sensed that maybe some of them thought he got what he deserved. Jeff shared with me earlier that day that Josh had told him that Jeff was his first visitor. And Josh was in prison for three years before Jeff visited him. After Josh was released from prison, something happened I won't share the painful circumstances, but through them, within 48 hours of his release, he relapsed. And within a few months after this, he went missing from his home, leaving his wallet and phone behind. A few, a few years later, it was found he was murdered. The heartbreaker was Jeff had met this young man when he had randomly sent a handwritten note to Bright Church from a local newspaper ad he had read online. Josh was looking for a Bible study to work on while he was incarcerated. Jeff responded with some books, but it didn't stop there. Jeff started making the two and a half mile, two and a half hour trip to see him in prison each month. Jeff shared at the funeral some of his letters from prison and how Josh was speaking about how he's growing and learning more and more about God's love. I think we all believed after hearing from Jeff that Josh would have said, I wish I could have been made better choices. I wish I could have been a better listener. I wish I could have been a better son or a better father. Jeff cried as he spoke, and we all cried as we connected that Jeff loved this young man. 
And he presented his memory in a way that honored and offered healing to his children, family, and friends. While none of us knew Josh's eternal destination, and we dreamed that he repented before his horrible death, Jeff's love for him reminded me that when our king returns in Matthew 25, he says, he will come, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you because when I was hungry and you fed me, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger and you invited me in your home, I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. This is the Jeff Stone whom the elders have learned to love. He is always kind, always forgiving, always thinking the best of you, even when you've earned otherwise. Jeff is a friend indeed. Jeff, the sharer of the good news. Jeff, the evangelizer. funeral without dying, so uh, that, that's good. It, just have a seat for just, just a, a moment. Uh, I've been very excited about this transition and see it as a very positive thing. Uh, probably two years ago, Gary Johnson began uh, serving as a coach to us uh, through this process because most churches don't do, do this, and, and it's, it's rare when it happens, and it happens successfully or correctly. And we went about a year ago, our elders went to a conference for elders' wives that was over in Indianapolis. Before we went, we, we prayed, Lord, maybe you'll point out someone to us at this conference who we'll have a chance to, to network and meet someone who might be our next lead minister. Friday night, I sat at a table with our group, and Saturday morning when we, we rolled in, uh, there were no seats there, so we went to another table, Johnny and, and I. And at that table, we met a, a great young couple and, and enjoyed getting to visit with them. Johnny sat with the wife at a session, and afterwards, I said, hey, we want to get together and eat with them. They were really nice. We maybe meet midway between Indy and meet in Greensburg, and that was our first introduction to Greg and, and Amy Evans, and uh, I encouraged them to enter into the, the process of being considered and, and uh, evaluated and sifted for this role, this position here. And, and out of all the names that, that we explored, uh, we became uh, convinced in an unanimous fashion that, that God had prepared Greg to be the next lead minister here at, at Brighton. He carries on the, com the compassion, the uh, enthusiasm, the, the evangelistic fervor, the, the love of people, and, he yeah, brings up an additional set of, of skills that will, will bless our church for a long time. So, Greg, would you stand? It, it is my uh, distinct honor and privilege to figuratively and physically pass the baton to you right now. And this baton has been inscribed for you. It's, it says, be faithful. And it's Revelation 2.10. Uh, for faithful until death, he will give us a crown of life. God bless you, brother. I, I told Jeff that I couldn't imagine receiving this baton from anyone else. And Jeff, you are cut from a great cloth. And after meeting your dad, Sam, and, and now Dave and Beth, and uh, I wish I could have met your mother, Gwen. Uh, but... Jeff is cut from a great cloth, isn't he? He's greatly cut from a great cloth. And I could not imagine receiving this baton. It means an awful lot to receive it from you. When we were at that retreat, uh, it made me think of something. Uh, Jeff had said, I'm going to get a real baton. I'm going to pass it. And I thought about the 2008 Olympics when... We were in the eagle's nest in China, Beijing. Maybe you remember the men's and women's four by 100 relay teams. It was the first time in history that both were disqualified in the first round. Um, there's a picture, a couple pictures that will come up on the screen. One is Tori Edwards and she's receiving the baton 
from Lauren Williams. And you can see the baton is close to the ground. She didn't take the baton well. In the men's 4x100, Tyson Gay, the picture will come up, he's one of the fastest uh, runners in the world for the United States, and he didn't receive the baton at all. At the end of that, in an interview, Tyson Gay said, I dropped the baton. I guess it's my fault. And Jeff has passed the baton well, and now it's my responsibility to carry the baton and not drop it. I want to do it well here at Bright Christian Church. I want to do all that Jeff has done here for the last 11 and a half years and all the people you mentioned before who've done incredible work here. Amy and I want to be a part of that and continue to do God-centered, God-honoring work in this place. So I'm going to ask Amy and Johnny to join me up here. Would you come up, please? I want to thank the Bright Christian Church family. Thank you for inviting Amy and I in. We have felt nothing but welcomed and loved. And Jeff and Johnny, you've been a huge part of that. Thank you for loving us, encouraging us, bringing us in. And I want to take a moment and just pray together as you transition to the teaching ministry. Let me say this, that a friend who was at the retreat, he said, I've been at my church 33 and a half years. We're about to go through a succession Jeff is staying. I don't know how this works. I think I'm going to have to leave because I have a following. And I don't think it would be good for the incoming minister. Jeff being here is very good. And I told that guy, I said, you know, it couldn't work with a lot of people. But with Jeff Stone, it will work. He is not in control. He's not trying to hold on to this church. He is an encourager to the core. And he wants nothing but great things for this place for you, this congregation, and for us as we lead the church. Thank you for leading with us. We look forward to the days ahead, ahead with Jeff and Johnny on board here at Bright Christian Church. Can we pray together? Father, we take a moment to say thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you for the gift of ministry. Thank you that Johnny has walked with Jeff for more than four decades in marriage and more than four decades in ministry. It's unheard of on both fronts. Thank you that Amy walks with me now. 20 years we've walked together and we've walked together all 20 years with you Christ as the center. And I pray God as we continue to work together here in ministry that God, you would continue to be the center. And Lord, I pray that you would give me just a touch of the humility that Jeff displays every day of his life. Thank you that he loves people. And thank you that that love for me has been displayed every day in the office. Even in his attitude of forgiveness when I don't run well. God, thank you for his humility, his gentleness, his passion and compassion. God, we offer you our lives, our marriages, our ministry. In the days ahead, God, would you do even greater things than we've ever dreamed of here at Bright Christian Church and in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.